All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University uh, for our webinar series, Impact Insights. We're so pleased to have you join us as we discuss how businesses can navigate the changing landscape as a result of not only the COVID pandemic, but also the social movement taking place around Black Lives Matter. We are dedicated to bringing you valuable insights and doing our part to create a, strong, a stronger Los Angeles community and beyond that embraces diversity of thought and experience. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good for the Los Angeles community and the global community. We are thrilled to have our very own Professor Rochelle Webb join us today. Rochelle specializes in global brand marketing across entertainment, retail, and technology sectors. She has extensive experience and accomplishments in corporate entities such as Activision, Quicksilver, Apple, and Visa. Indeed, she brings all of her experience into the classroom as an LMU professor. But in addition, she is also an, a, an entrepreneur and a consultant. Rochelle recently launched a venture, Optimus Made, and it is a new way of shopping around the world without actually having to travel, which is quite convenient during these times. It makes the inaccessible accessible. It gives developing fashion designers a destination where they can have a voice to be discovered. When a product is sold, Optimus Made then gives back to productive charities around the world. In light of COVID and Black Lives Matter, Rochelle will be talking to us today about what the Black owned business during these unprecedented times. Without further ado, Rochelle Webb. Okay, great. Um, okay. So, okay, sorry about that. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for allowing me to be here and share this space with you. And I want to take a moment to thank Loyola Marymount University for allowing me to share my story, um, to be a part of this community and help train the next generation of business leaders. I, um, it's a true honor and I um, want to give a special thanks to Dean Dale Smith and for believing in me and trusting me uh, with the you know, these thriving bodies that um, move through our campus every day and believing in me that I could help make a difference. And I also wanted to give a special thanks to David Choi, who um, is the head of our Kiesner Center of Entrepreneurship, who also um, took a chance on me. And um, joining the LMU community really was a, a time when I presented myself and um, they believed in me and they thought that I was the person that could actually help this campus move to a more progressive place to help these students thrive and grow. Um, you know, I came in and just, I came as I am. And, um, you know, and, and other times throughout my career, you know, I have had help. I've needed to have help. I've needed to have advocates to help me um, move through the corporate world um, to say that this is a person that we believe is a strong business leader. And so for me, it's just been um, one of those places in my life where I just feel like I did this on my own because of my own merit. And that's been um, something that I, I reflect on often and, um, and I'm so grateful for. And um, part of my interview process was to be reviewed by my peer set um, of professors that teach alongside me at LMU and they also believed in me. So I thank you for the vote of confidence and for, um, you know, putting trust in me because that's, um, it's, you know, that's, a, that's important and it's a part of being in a minority that you often um, carry a lot of insecurities with you, you carry a lot of baggage. And so the fact that um, I have a community that trusts me so much means so incredibly, it uh, means a lot to me. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, so I'm here today to talk about what it means to be part of that minority and what it means to run a business as a female, as a black woman, as a, you know, as someone who, you know, is not part of the dominant culture um, in a time when there's a lot of vulnerabilities happening around the world. So I'm going to share my screen and take you guys through a little bit of a journey and please, you know, feel free to ask questions along the way and um, make this interactive if you'd like and um, or we can hold questions to the end, whatever you guys are comfortable with. 
I wanted to start here. Um, this is my beginning. <laughs> and um, this is sometime in the 80s. Uh, and who you see in the middle there is, is my grandmother. And she was an incredibly important person to me. She was, um, a, she's a big part of who the woman that I am today. Um, on, the, on the right side of the screen, you see my youngest brother. And then um, many of you might recognize that little young child, my little young girl on the left, and that's, that's me, of course. Um, and the reason I wanted to start here is because this, at this point in my life, I didn't know. I didn't know what, lay, what lied ahead. I didn't know that there was a, anything called adversity. I didn't know that I was a minority. I didn't know that I was different from other people. You know, this is, you know, when you're in your earliest years of life, it's your purest state of mind. It's when, you know, you haven't had those moments of being judged. You haven't yet had those moments of, you know, being told that, you know, you're not doing something the right way. You haven't had those moments of being championed and cheered on. And so, you know, this was a time in my life when, I was developing and just forming who I was going to become. And that woman in the middle was a pillar. Um, and she has had so much of an impact on who I have become. And I am so grateful for her. And um, she helped raise me. Both of my parents worked very hard to give my brother and I a fighting chance at um, being able to compete and keep up. And so it's just, um, it's very reflective on how I've moved through life as Rochelle Webb. And so, um, you know, I think we all have that person we look up to. And I've been in more than a few job interviews before where they've asked me who my mentor is um, and, and, and who my inspiration, where do I draw my inspiration from? And many people will throw out names of huge leaders in the world um, that have made an impact. And for me, it's often been my grandmother because she truly has um, been such an important part to my perseverance, um, to me being as headstrong as I am, to how I how I think and how I react and how I become resourceful in times when um, you know resources are lacking. And so um, I'm just I wanted to honor her in this moment because she is a very important part of who I have become. So this is a little bit about me. Um, for those of you that do not know who I am, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship and marketing at Loyola Marymount University. I have, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I went to a pretty prestigious private school in Atlanta, Georgia called the Lovett School and went on to Boston College for my undergraduate degree and got my MBA from Berkeley. Um, from there, I knew that I was going to go into marketing. I wanted to do brand marketing, and I went on to work for some pretty large corporations around the world, and you'll see some of the logos here, Apple, Visa, Activision, and Quicksilver, um, where I oversaw global brand marketing and media um, for those various brands. And then um, below, you will see um, organizations where I've either um, been a board advisor or I sit on the board um, as a member or as an, a part of their executive board. And so it's this, this, this slide um, to many people was, looks like, wow, this, this woman has no issues, you know? Like, look how, look at these, this, this great pathway she created for herself and look at all of these accomplishment, accomplishments she has and look at what she's achieved. But all of this was very hard. <laughs> um, you know, the reason I went to this private school was because my parents wanted to give me a chance. They wanted to say, let's help her level up because she's going to have a hard time doing that just on how she looks. But the problem was when I got there, I didn't look like anybody else and I was different. And, um, you know, and there was this feeling of wow, like there's obviously something that's different with this person than everybody else. I went to the school from when I was four, year old, four years old to when I graduated at 18. And, you know, and then with enough times of the verbal ju judgment or the nonverbal judgment, you just start to carry insecurities with you and you start to feel as if, you know, you, it's, you don't want to speak up because you're scared of being judged. And so for me, words really mattered. And I often sat back and I reflected on what I heard and I didn't speak 
until I really had something important to say, because I knew that when I opened my mouth, I was going to be judged for every single thing that came out of it. And what's interesting about this is while I didn't feel the freedom to just think out loud, which is how a lot of people do learn and how a lot of people thrive. It's, it's actually made me the leader I am today because I am the type of person who does like to absorb information. I like to craft ideas and thoughts in my head. And then I like to react to them as they've formed in my head. And I think a lot of that comes from feeling as if I couldn't really speak up as openly as I would like. Um, and many of, the, of you that are on this call today know me very well and know that I'm not somebody who minces my words and I'm a pretty direct and outspoken person. So um, if you can just imagine what's going on in my head, <laughs> it's a whole different story. Um, but then, you know, going on to Boston College, again, uh, I didn't, you know, the percentages didn't change. There were just more people there. So I saw more people that looked like me, but in the grand scheme of things, I was still a minority and then, you know, going on to Berkeley, um, you know, you were, I was in a cohort, I was a later stage in my life. And so, you know, it wasn't that, that sort of adversity wasn't really there as much, but the bias still existed. And so it's just, you know, I just want to, I, I point this out because I think it's important to understand that, you know, things are not always what they seem. And I think that a lot of people will sometimes look at me and say, she's got it. She doesn't need any help. You know, she's, look at how far she's come, you know, black lives, you know, th th they're caught up, you know, look at what she's accomplished. But this, I mean, this to me, accomplishing what's on this slide felt like I was running in mud. Um, it just felt like it was so incredibly hard to reach all of these goals in my life. Um, but in every single one of them, it was a step change towards the next. And so I've carried this with me and it's made me the business leader I am, it's made me the professor that I am, and it's made me the marketer that I am. And so, um, you know, I just want to caution people that, you know, one major thing that can come out of what we're going through right now is advocacy. And that'll be really the red thread of what we talk about today. So um, my purpose is, has really been as someone who has often felt like an underdog in my life, that, you know, if I didn't have those people early on in my life help me and, and stand up for me and say, this is a person who matters, this is a person that can make a difference, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am today. Um, because if those people didn't proactively step up and try to help me, um, then, it, you know, I wouldn't have reach these accomplishments and goals that I've achieved in my life. And so that word proactively is so important when you think about how you stand up and how you show up for somebody. Um, and this is exactly why I, I founded this company, Optimist Made, because there are so many people out there like me who are incredibly talented, but they're so incredibly insecure about their ability to thrive, their ability to make it, um, and they won't speak up for themselves. Um, and it's the same way that I teach, you know, when I teach to a classroom, I'm constantly looking at the body language of the students because there are certain people who just are insecure about speaking up in a group setting. And sometimes you just have to look out for those individuals and you have to look out for them in a different way than you would for those who naturally fall into this pocket of being outspoken and standing up for themselves and advocating for themselves. And so for me as the founder of Optimist Made, I felt like, wow, you know, there are people out there that helped me. How can I do this for so many other people? And so I created a company that's founded on the business model of, you know, taking it on as my duty to help and serve others and taking it on as my duty to tell their stories and to make sure they're seen and they're heard and that they can actually do what they're so great at, which is um, their artistry of creating and designing and manufacturing and sharing that with other people in the, around the world who may ordinarily never know who they are. And who you see to the right here are um, a couple of my designers from Croatia. Um, they are the heads of the design head and the operation head for a brand called Hippie Garden, a super cool trendy brand. Um, and, you know, they Croatia has, is, is a developing country. I mean, it, it's, you know, their dream would be to make it big. Their dream is, you know, to compete with a lot of these big brands in the U.S. market, but they just never thought it was possible. And 
as I got to know them and I got to see their drive, it just helped form for me this need to want to create that pathway for them. And so what I've done is I've taken my experience in marketing and I've repurposed that to help others to be able to accomplish and achieve their goals of competing in a market like the US when they ordinarily you know, would think that, that that's not a place they would be. And so that's really the foundational mission of the company and, um, and why we exist. And I like to start with this slide often because it really speaks to me as an individual and it speaks to, you know, the people that we support. Um, you know, on one side here, you see a person who's, you know, not willing to lose. He's unrelenting. You know, he is, you know, if he sees that he's falling behind in a race, he's going to push that much harder to make sure that he edges his competition out of the game. And then on the, the right hand side, you see somebody who's never going to stop trying to win. You know, he was a champion in his own right, but for many, many years fell off the map. And it was sort of what happened to Tiger Woods, you know, and, um, and it, this speaks to perseverance, you know, he, he, he was not willing to give up on where he started which was being a champion in the game of golf. And so these two men, they have the, you know, they have the same goal, but they had two different ways of approaching it. And they had two different mindsets. But at the end of the day, um, it's about getting started and it's about keeping, keeping it going. And um, the hardest part oftentimes is getting started. And, and people will often say to me, you know, how do you do all the things that you do? And you just have to start. You can't overthink it. And, um, you know, I think that there's a part of what, you know, there's an analytical part of what both of these human beings do in order to be successful in their sport. But at the end of the day, it's heart, it's drive, and it's, it's being headstrong and committed to the end goal that's so important and what's, what, what ultimately gets them across the finish line. And so this is exactly what I try to help my entrepreneurs see. It's in there, um, but the problem with an underdog is that you know, people expect them to lose. And so if they don't have someone that believes in them and, think, and knows they can win, and, and can really champion them for that, then they will just sit there in stagnation and the world will miss out on great talent. And so for me, it's important that I unpack that stagnation and I turn that into progress. And so um, this is really, a, you, know, you know, looking at this dichotomy and the, the, the two different mindsets of these two individuals is really forms for me um, where, I, you know, where I get my design paradigm from. So this brings me to the mission of my company, which is, you know, we want to be in the business of stimulating the underdog economy. We have a global economy um, that is at about $3 trillion. Um, and, and, and a lot of that is a long tail of small businesses that contribute to that. Um, they contribute to a lot of jobs. Uh, but the problem is, is that a lot of these small businesses uh, never really get to realize the opportunity that's out there for them because they don't have someone that can help train them and develop them and to show them what that path forward looks like. And so that's really what the mission of Optimus Made is. It's, it's not only in just investing in these designers and, and showing them that, you know, that you can get, you don't have to be hand to mouth all the time. I do want you to be able to be strategic, but then it's also training them on how to be strategic and how to use that investment to move their business forward. And so by stimulating this underdog economy, we're opening up a whole nother realm of economic stimulation that can help the, our global economy thrive. And so um, this is really where we start. Um, and this is um, and what, what keeps us going ultimately. And um, our, our goal is not to keep these keep these talent for ourselves it's to groom them so that they have they it can open many more doors for them to thrive in other spaces so these are my dogs <laughs> and um i think it speaks to the underdog mindset and 
um, they are all rescues. And that's always, that's been an important mission to me because as you can see thematically, um, I'm someone who likes to fight for those who don't have that very obvious chance. Um, I like to fight for those who um, seemingly won't make it in life because I believe they can. And so these dogs started in a place where, you know, who knew if they were going to end up in a home? You know, who, you know, who, who, who knew where, what the, 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 their lives were going to look like? And, um, you know, for me, I, it was, you know, I wanted to give them a place where they could thrive. And now they have this great life and you can just see the evolution of their personalities evolve over the time that I've had them. You can see them start to, you know, um, have this air of confidence of I belong. Um, I belong in this home. This is this is my territory, um, and I'm going to stay committed to stand. You know that this is this is the place that I need to be. And this is very similar to an underdog in life and business. Um, you know, oftentimes they they move through life much like I did, a feeling like I you don't belong, um, and feeling like every time you bring up something so obvious about you, something that's so important, um, like the color of your skin, that it makes people uncomfortable. And who wants to move through life feeling like who they are makes people uncomfortable? And so, you know, I had to compensate for a lot of that by, you know, having a lot of personality, trying to win people over. And it is exhausting. It's, 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 it gets to the point where, you know, you really just want to take an extended nap. And it's just, you know, um, it's one of those things where, you know, you just can never turn the nozzle off because, you know, otherwise you just turn into the background and you sort of start to disappear. And I saw this happen to a lot of my classmates is that, you know, we had a choice to make. You could either become a part of the community that you were in, or you could choose to recluse yourself. Um, and then people, you become forgettable. And, and for me, that wasn't an option. I, was, I refuse to be forgettable. I get one chance at life in this body and I'm gonna make the best use of it that I possibly can. And I wanna be as memorable as possible. And so it's been, as I move through everything that I do, it's, you know, that's what I strive for. I strive to leave an impression. I, I strive to be seen. I strive to be heard, um, you know, regardless of what I look like. Um, and regardless of what preconceived notions are buried behind the person that I'm staring at on the other side of that conversation, um, you know, for me, it's not an option to disappear. I'm not invisible. I'm very much here. I'm very much a part of this world. I'm an active member of this world. And um, that's how I want to be seen. And I want to be seen as a force. And um, so it's just, you know, you do carry insecurities with you that sometimes make you reflect and say, you know, am I, am I, you know, um, and you start to self doubt and all of this starts to mask who you really are. And so one thing I say often to people that I mentor and to people um, that reach out to me for advice is to play bigger than who you think you are, because then you're playing who you actually are. Um, and I think that oftentimes a lot of us default, especially when you're in, you're part of a minority and you're part of, um, you know, a group of people who are expected to lose. You're an underdog. You often fall to this place of, you know, diminishing yourself and playing small and being meek and just not trying to, not trying to make waves. And, 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 and you're just disappearing at that point. And so for me, it's, you know, it's important to establish, you know, who you are and, and let people know that you do have a presence and that you're, you have staying power. Um, and, and so, you know, and that is, it's not easy, you know, it, it's hard for all of us, regardless of, you know, your background and who you are, but some people just naturally gravitate to it because they haven't had to face much adversity at this point in their life. And so I just, you know, to me, when I think about, you know, rescuing a dog, you know, I just think to, they start from this place of not knowing if they have a chance at life, you know, and to the, to then also to them becoming a place, getting to a place where they're like, no, this is where I belong. And I think that's what we all strive to feel as part of something. So 
I went, you know, as I reflect, I have a lot of heroes in my life, but generationally, these are three people who have really, um, to, who speak to me um, in very different ways. And the far left, you have um, Madam C.J. Walker. She is the first ever self-made Black female millionaire. Um, she started a, a beauty care line, but what she actually tried to do when she started this beauty care line was to collaborate with another Black woman. And try to to help her she said i can sell your product you know let me join you let me be a part of i believe in what you're doing let me be a part of it and this woman said no you don't have the face to sell my product and madam cj walker could have in that moment said to herself wow like i'm nothing and just fallen away and just and just settled in the fact that this person diminished her to this place of feeling like you can't do this, you know? And you're often told as a minority and as an underdog, you can't, you can't, you can't. Oh, that'll never be you. But what she did is she rose above. She said, I'm not gonna just do it, I'm gonna do it better. And that's the mentality that I think you have to have as an entrepreneur and even more so as a minority owned entrepreneur. As a black woman, I'm the least funded individual out there when it comes to starting a business and when it comes to fundraising. And so I have to, yet again, I have to shout from the mountaintops to be heard and to let people know, you know, I am a company that's trying to do good in the world, but in order for people to see me and hear that, I have to shout 10 times louder than the person starting the tech company or the person that's, you know, you know, looks like the guys who are investing um, or, you know, any other bias that exists out there. There's many of them. And um, so her mindset is it's so formidable. And, and to me, that's what I admire the most about her. And then we have a very obvious leader here in the middle and, and Martin Luther King Jr. And um, this is a person that in most rooms that he stood in took a, took a place of authority. He took a position of power um, and he, he didn't rest on his laurels. He didn't let anyone shut him down. He made sure that he left an impression. He made sure he was heard. And, and that to me, um, is one of the strongest places that you can come from. It's the strongest position you can, you can, you, you can lead from. It's this place of I belong and no one's gonna take that away from me. Even though this was at a time where he didn't belong according to the law. And he fought, fought for the basic civil rights of human beings um, that didn't have the same color skin as a dominant culture. And so for me, it's just, I. What I, get, what I get from him is the fact that I'm not going to allow myself to be scared to fight for what I believe in. I'm not gonna allow myself to feel nervous or to feel you know, unsettled in the fact that I'm fighting for people who are not the usual suspects of the people that make it in, in business and in life. And so I, I, I want to go against the grain. I want to agitate um, because agitation means progress. It means creating a more thriving community. It means creating a world where we revel in people's differences and we, we, we champion people's differences and we love that. Um, and so for, you know, that to me is from what I draw from him is that this has to be my mission, no matter how hard it is and how tired I am, I can't stop fighting for those that don't have the same opportunities as the dominant culture. And so as a black woman, um, it's a role that I step into naturally. And then on the right hand side, you see um, a, a household name that many of us, you know, probably all know, and Oprah Winfrey, and a lot of people look at her and say, she has no problems. She's Oprah, you know, um, she's worth billions of dollars, you know, she can give away all this. Everyone loves her. Everyone listens to her. But where she started, um, because she was overweight, because she was black, because she had nappy hair, it was like, you know, someone found her and said, I think you can be in this movie and play a slave, um, but you're going to need to work on yourself. You know, you're going to need to change who you are to be, to, to actually be able to step into this role. And, you know, and she, she did those things because she felt like that's what she needed to do to accept to, to to thrive 
But then there got to a point where she became unapologetic about who she was. She embraced it. And she came from a place of power and then I'm a strong black woman. And for me, that's so important. Um, I, I, don't, I don't care how many people make me feel not enough. I know I'm enough. And so it's important to me to make sure that I harness that in every, every, every position possible. And you know, when I work with these underdog entrepreneurs, I can come from a place of understanding. Um, I'm a very empathetic leader and I try to put myself in other people's shoes often. So in this whole idea of strengthening and supporting the underdog community, it comes naturally to me because I am one. And so, you know, when I think about all the influences I've had across my time and, and, and where I draw inspiration from, um, not only does that come from my grandmother, who's someone I know personally, but these individuals here have been really important to paving the way to making it okay to stand up for what you believe in. So this brings us to where we are today. Um, we are facing a serious pandemic that has caused our world to shut down. It has caused us to move through life in a much different way than what we're used to. It has changed our normal in ways that we would have never have imagined. Uh, I think for many of us, we've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. And, um, but, what it's also caused is for us to start thinking differently and to start behaving differently in reaction to what's happening to us. Um, so when the world shuts down, how do you keep going? How do you keep moving? How do you keep thriving? And this what's so interesting about this pandemic is, is for the first time, it's affecting everyone in the same way globally. Uh, so suddenly it's neutralized this idea of not being able to do the things you're used to doing. Um, and some, and a lot of piece of people have lost jobs. A lot of people have had to face, you know, how do I run a household and how do I do my job with kids that, at, at home uh, or grandkids at home? And, you know, how do I do move through my day, you know, with dogs barking in the background and all these different things. And some of them, are, these issues are smaller than others, but they're all still issues, right? And it all, it's all stuff that we have to figure out how to how to adapt to. Um, and as a black woman, I've had to figure out how to adapt my whole life. So what's been so interesting about COVID is that, um, you know, is that it's forced people to have to feel what it's like to have to reorganize your life because something was taken away from you. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, when I reflect on everything that we're going through right now, it feels very purposeful, which brings us to this. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And this is a human rights issue. This is a systemic problem in our world and, you know, and, and, and to an entire race of individuals where lives are being lost because of their color of their skin. Um, opportunities are not, you know, being made available to people because of the color of their skin. Um, and this is that really, that really head on, um, systemic um, adversity that an entire race is facing, right? And so, but the fact that COVID happened and then the George Floyd incident happened shortly after that, it, it put people in a mindset of understanding what it feels like to have something taken away from you during the pandemic. And then it also gave people the forced space to have to focus on something. And so suddenly we have a lot of people paying attention to what's happening because a lot of the busyness of running around through your day has gone away and you're at home moving through your day and sheltering in place and you're forced to look at and to acknowledge what is actually happening in the world to an entire race of individuals. And, um, and in a whole different way, this has impacted you know, how a certain race moves through life. Um, how, you know, for me, I, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of friends, you know, reach out to me to check in on me, see how I'm doing. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, I have people that look like me. I have black friends who are very rageful and angry about everything that's happening. And so am I, you know, this has been happening to me my whole life. But when I took a step back and I reflected on what's happening in the world, I said, I need to come at a place 
from, for solutions and progress because being angry at this point isn't doing anything for everybody, anybody. People are waking up, people are listening, they're receptive. That's something I've never experienced in my life. Um, to this point, when I've brought up my race, I physically see people shut down, they change the subject, they get uncomfortable in their own skin, they can't make eye contact with me. Um, and, and I'm like, look at me, this is who I am. I am a black woman, I want you to see me as that. I don't want you to normalize our relationship by saying I'm just like you because I'm not. You know, as a white person, you know, you telling me that I'm just like you is robbing me of something that's so important and such a big part of me. Um, and so, so the fact that we have this space and time for people to pay attention and take notice of, of what's been happening is, is, is so important. And in so many ways, I feel like these two things needed to happen in conjunction with one another. Um, we needed um, this sort of, this, you know, this, this merge of two huge, um, you know, epidemics, pandemics, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, impacting how we think um, and how we process. And so um, these are the two things as a business owner, as a black female business owner that have affected me. And so we could take, we could, we could, we could look at this as scary, which it, it all very much is, but we can also look at it as, as an op op opportunity, which is what I did. And I just felt like this is a chance for me to do something. So I took two days to think about and to reflect on how I wanted to react to what was happening. And then I started acting. I started talking. I started making sure my story could be heard. I started, you know, working with other people that who didn't look like me and talking about white allyship, talking about what parenting looks like. How do you educate your, your kids on, on, on civil rights, on race, on, on why they see people in the world that don't look like them, um, you know, and, and what that means and, um, and what it means to be anti-racism. Um, all of these things are conversations that have never happened in my existence, you know, uh, to the velocity at which they're happening right now. And so I felt like I needed to jump into this on a springboard and I wanted to start putting more solutions out there as someone who's been affected by it. And this is a very entrepreneurial way of behaving. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to look at what's around you and to react to that. Um, you have to figure out, you know, how do I create a very real solution for these issues that exist in the world? And so, so I think that um, we all as human beings need to think about how we can behave in a more productive way with everything that's happening. Um, and it goes back to what I said earlier on in this talk about, you know, taking proactive steps and proactive measures to be a part of the solution. So for Optimus Made, it was important to um, turn lemons into lemonade. I was in the middle of fundraising when COVID hit, which brought that to an abrupt halt. I, um, I, you know, business stopped because people weren't spending money. Um, people had more time, but it just, they were, didn't know what was going to happen with their jobs or, you know, what was going to happen, you know, with their income. And so there was just a, a real noticeable shift in the pr product productivity of business for me and Optimus Made. And so I turned that into an opportunity and I said, well, people are wearing masks. I have a very agile business model. I'm going to work with one of my designers and I'm going to create a sustainable mask. And I've seen, not only have I seen business increase exp exponentially as a result of that, but I'm also cultivating and growing my community because people are then poking around and saying, what else is this brand about? I've been able to evolve, evolve my storytelling medium, which is really important part of this brand um, because people are craving content, they're craving information, um, they're craving you know, more things to engage with while they're sheltering in place. And so this was a way that I reacted to what was happening. And then when people realized this pandemic wasn't going away anytime, anytime soon, people started to take meetings virtually for fundraising. So it, it became less about flying here to pitch to us and let's jump on a Zoom. So it suddenly has opened up the aperture of opportunities for Optimus Made in terms of what we can invest in uh, or who I can pitch to for investing and, and how I can react um, in this world that we're living in. 
And then with Black Lives Matter, this was a real awakening. And so this also gave me platforms like this one to speak up for myself and to advocate for myself, but also to create space for people to advocate for me. And, and that's been a really amazing thing to watch over the past few weeks was the willingness that people have to partner, the willingness that people have to jump in and wanna be a part of what I'm doing. Um, like I said, I've never really felt comfortable talking about my race and my differences, but now, you know, people are open to being uncomfortable. And so I've stopped walking on eggshells and now I'm breaking them because I'm like, if you're gonna listen, I'm gonna talk. And so I'm here for it. And I really am, I want to see this progress into something bigger. Um, than just, you know, a, a learning opportunity and more of an acting opportunity. And so what does this mean for us? This is challenging for everyone. And just because you're white doesn't mean that this isn't hard. You know, anytime that you're having to lean into something that, you know, you felt like maybe you weren't doing this the right way, or maybe, you know, you weren't being a part of, um, you know, what's happening in the right way, you know, you that's uncomfortable. And so we are actually in this together, you know, and I know that's a hashtag and it's a, it's a phrasing that's thrown around a lot, but we really are in this together and we can't, we can't reap progress without working through this as a, as a connective unity. Um, we have to move through this together. Um, we need a call for action. Um, we need to do something and we need to make it stick. And that's the really important part. People are asking me often, you know, do you think that this is actually gonna, you know, we're gonna see anything come out of this? Um, do, we, do you actually think that, you know, that what we're going through has staying power, this receptivity? And to me, um, I'm hopeful. I, I hope the answer to that is yes. And so the players that you have are, you have the citizen, which is you, and then you have businesses. This is who you support with your time and with your money. Um, many people here work for companies. Um, some of you give your mind share to certain companies. Um, and a lot of you spend with certain companies. And so it's looking at the, a shift in um, how you're using those resources, who, thinking about who you're supporting and, and, and coming at, at that with strategy. You know, voting with your wallet um, is one thing, but voting with your wallet and having a strategy behind it is quite another. And that's how you see change. That's how you see progress is you create a movement. So yes, you, there's things that you can do as an individual, but we are stronger together. And it's, it's, it's speaking out, word of mouth is still the most productive form of marketing. And so think about this movement and how you support others in the same way. Um, how do you talk about the things that you've been doing? And that's what I would love to see. Rather than black boxes on social media, um, you know, for Blackout Tuesday, why, why don't you post, you know, something productive that you have done to contribute to, you know, creating a more equitable world for all of us. Because people can learn from that. You're creating a learning environment by doing that. And you're becoming an advocate. Um, and, and, and that advocacy is so important, but what's the most important is doing that proactively. And so, you know, I think that's what I want to impress on people the most is that being a productive part of how you advocate for someone is how you see change. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what what's next what you can do and so when you think about the pandemic and you think about covid um you know i had to think about how do i make my company recession proof how do i ensure that i'm going to survive what's happening right now in the world and again you have to evolve and you have to react based on what's happening around you you have to fill a need um, partnering. One thing I did was I partnered with other business owners many that didn't look like me because I felt like sharing the mic with someone that didn't look like me, but was in the same position from an entrepreneurial standpoint was only going to help, you know, the world expand, the, you know, the, the, the line of sight for me as a business owner and for the other person. So it was a win-win situation. Um, and so figuring out how you can partner, if you are a business owner out there, and if you are a business owner of color, thinking about who you can partner with that can help you thrive and that you can help each other thrive. And then pivoting when necessary. Pivoting is not a bad thing. Pivoting is, you know, is figuring out how do you work smarter, not harder. And so these were a few of the things that I did um, to help myself overcome the pan issues of the pandemic. And then 
I was, you know, hit with the Black Lives Matter movement and, um, and I reflected on this and this was a, a soft launch I did of my brand um, two years ago. And what you'll see here are my day one supporters. Um, these are the people that came out. These, this was the day I made my first dollar at Optimus Made. Um, and what you'll notice here is that most of these people are, all of these people don't look like me. Um, and the majority of these people are white individuals. They are part of the dominant culture. And what they did is they stood up for me, they advocated for me, and they told me that they believed in me. And that made the biggest difference in the world. That took that doubt and that insecurity that's in the back of your head as a black woman, because you just feel, you feel oftentimes that you aren't enough and it made me feel more than enough. And so just showing up is one thing that you can do to make a difference in the world. So if you ask me again, I just want to reinforce you, reinforce to you that I am hopeful and I do think we're going to see change. And I think that the world's going to be a better place because of what's happening. I think that we all as human beings are going to become entrepreneurial in how we, um, how we think about how we act as a human being. Um, we're going to get into the business of being good humans. And I think that, um, that's an amazing and incredible path forward. And I think there's, there's no other option but to win. Um, I have the Usain Bolt Tiger Woods mentality of, um, you know, we are going to be stronger together and we are going to get through this. So I wanted to thank you for listening to my story. I wanted to thank you for showing up today. Uh, that is a huge step. The fact that you are willing to make space in your schedule to listen um, to a talk on this topic is already being a part of the change. So thank you and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Rochelle. And thank you so much for your authenticity, your realism and your optimism and your hopefulness. I mean, it, it really means a lot, I think, for, for our students at CBA and for the overall community. So we do have a couple of questions here um, and thank you to everyone who submitted questions. So, um, and we did do a little bit of upvoting. So I'm gonna start with Kenzie's question. And she says, hi, Professor Webb. Uh, thank you so much for your encouragement and honesty in this conversation. What advice would you give young black professionals who look to lead and occupy predominantly white spaces? How do you maintain a balance between being a professional and a vulnerable human being? Hi, Kenzie, first of all, I miss you so much. Um, and uh, that's a great question. And it's, it, you do have to be authentic. You just have to own who you are, what, do it with respect. Um, I think that, um, a lot of the reasons why people are judged is based on their delivery and how you deliver information. It's not necessarily what you're saying. I've heard a lot of people say some very controversial, um, very, you know, you know, very um, unnerving things, but because of the way that they delivered it, um, it was, it became okay that they were saying what they were saying. And so um, I think that as a black woman, uh, you know, we get put into this position of, you know, even as a woman, when you speak up on certain things, you, you know, people will say, oh, she's emotional. She's, you know, this type of individual, you know, she can't manage or control herself, you know, and that's a tough place to be in. But I think if you, you can say the things that you want to say with conviction, but in a way that, you know, doesn't, I don't believe in removing emotion from what I'm saying, but I think that you can say it in a way that creates a safe space. Because if you just think about as a minority person, how unsafe sometimes you have felt um, in certain situations speaking up, um, you almost have to do the reverse of that when you're trying to make a change or you know, you're trying to move through a world of people that, doesn't, that don't look like you. Because in order to be heard, you, have to, you do have to speak up and say the things that matter, but you have to say it in a way where people are gonna hear it and they're gonna listen. Um, and I think that when you come from this place of, you know, very like harsh, emotional, strong words, um, you know, people will tend to shut down and all they're doing is seeing the emotion and they're not listening to the words that are coming out of your mouth. So I would just say that, you know, 
first of all, it's, you do have to earn respect. You know, you have to work and, you know, walk into a situation and um, you know, get some wins under your belt to show people what you're made of, because as an underdog, they're expecting you to lose. And you have to show them that regardless of what situation that you're served, you are going to win. You are going to be a contributor and you're going to be collaborative and you're going to be open to feeling, feeling, figuring out how to be a more productive part of that community. And then suddenly, once you earn these badges of honor, people are more receptive to listening to you. Um, so this goes back to one of my earlier points of it's a, it's work, but you know, I think that we are in a place where people are becoming more receptive and, and I hope that people are more willing to proactively listen and that it's not so much of an uphill battle. Thank you for that. Um, Alexander has a question. Netflix recently decided to deposit 100 million of its cash in black owned banks. What are some other ways large corporations can effectively support black communities? Oh, I just saw that yesterday and I, oh my gosh, I, there's, I'm not someone who gets very emotional. I'm not really like someone who cries at a lot of things, but there's, um, you know, this, anytime I talk about just the, the, the idea of an underdog, I get choked up. I get very emotional about it because I am one and I know how hard it's been to thrive in this body. And um, so anytime I think about the fact that, you know, people are rallying around, um, an underdog individual or community, I, it just gives me so much hope. And it just, you know, that's the story. That's how you hope the story ends. So I just loved that they did that and they supported black owned banks. The biggest way that you can support um, within large organizations like that is to, to hire for who's trainable. And I think oftentimes what people do is they hire for exactly the, the bullet points that are on a job description rather than hiring for the individual. And because you can you can train anyone to do a job, but you can't train hard worker, you can't train perseverance, you can't train intelligence, you can't train these certain essential skills that are needed to, to do well in an organization. The problem is when you go down a bullet pointed list of things that someone needs to have to thrive in a job, a lot of minorities aren't going to have that because systemically we haven't been in environments where we've been able to have the opportunity to learn those bullet pointed list of things. We haven't had the, we haven't had the chance to have the experiences to be hired into jobs to give us the level of experience that a lot of these job descriptions are looking for. So if you shift your mentality to hiring for who's trainable, who has that, the, the passion and the drive to do the job and know that you can train them to do the things on that list, that's a huge, you will start to see that you have a much more diverse community. And I hope that in the face of this pandemic, now that people can work remotely, that we start looking into other areas and pockets um, communities that are, um, that where there are a lot of minorities and people of color and start hiring out of those areas rather than just sticking with the area where the business is located. Great, thanks for that. And we have another question. How might we bring opportunities to organizations that could really ensure that businesses are truly inclusive and ensuring black colleagues and brown and other underrepresented communities can move into leadership opportunities and positions of influence? Yeah, I mean, I think in making them a part of the conversation, I've always said, and this, you know, this, even taking the color out of it, um, you know, most companies are built on a certain hierarchy. Um, and, and you can do your job the best when you have the most perfect information. And I'm sure that you can all relate to being left out of a portion of an email chain or a text chain, even in your personal life. And then you kind of are coming in and you're like, well, I don't know what's going on. Like, you know, I missed the beginning of this conversation um, because you didn't have perfect information. You know, you weren't able to react in a way that, um, you know, where you were reacting from a place where you had all of the, the information. And so in businesses, you know, what happens is, you know, people don't want meetings to get too big. So they are like, okay, well, let's go down the list and decide who we're going to invite to the meeting. And typically what ends up happening is the most senior individual level individuals end up getting invited to the meeting. And those people have all the information, but because of their jobs and what's expected of them, they don't necessarily have the time to make sure that trickle down effect happens of that information. So therefore, the lower level employees are operating from a place of disadvantage because they don't know what happened in the meeting. They don't know what happened in the room unless someone sends a debrief. And um, 
so that's the same thing with people of color is that we we often aren't included in the conversations we aren't the people that are at that operating at that level therefore it makes it very hard for us to be the most productive that we can because we don't have perfect information so i think that creating inclusive and community means inviting people proactively into that conversation and making them a part of it and if you are gonna you know build dni um a dni component to what you're doing is to you know make sure you're including the people that are impacted by it um oftentimes people are like oh look we need to advocate and be there for the black people or for the people of color um so let's figure out what we're going to do for them and it's like well, why don't you ask them because you know when you start to have that type of conversation then you'll understand exactly what the, where the needs lie and then you can react to that Fantastic. So we just have a few more questions and we'll be ending soon. Um, would you please give an example of one of your pivots? Um, okay, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that is with my business during all of the things that have been happening. So, um, so one of my pivots was that, well, I gave the example of creating sustainable the mask, um, which was not a business I ever imagined myself being in. Um, but I had an opportunity with a designer that was very sustainable, um, that allowed me not only to do something that was good for the world, but um, it also allowed me to lean into um, giving something to the consumer that was necessary and needed. Um, another thing that I did was I started creating content. Um, so if you go to Optimus Maid's Instagram and you go to our IG channel, you'll see there's a series of content called Real Talk. And what I do on there is I talk about a lot of these issues around um, what's happening in the world. And um, I always knew there would be a content strategy built into what I was doing, but we are at a time that where it presented itself to be very necessary for these types of conversations to be incubated and to be had and shared to the world. So I, I pivoted and started to create, you know, create this platform of content and this series of content was something that like, I didn't necessarily have on the roadmap for right now. So those are two, the two of the biggest things that I've done. Great. And we can assume, because this is a question from Nancy, that we can purchase the sustainable mass on your website. Yes, yes. Um, so the first um, tranche of masks that I had was actually an LMU collaboration with the Sawandi Foundation. Um, Caitlin and Lily are two students of LMU and they have created a foundation to feed families and teach kids in Bali. Um, and so we created these sustainable masks and initially we gave a portion of our profits to the Sawandi Foundation to help them continue their mission. And so now with the next wave of masks that we have, it's going to be supporting Black Lives Matter. Um, organizations. So um, specifically, we're going to be um, Campaign Zero is one that we're going to be supporting. Um, we supported Mob Ballet, which is um, helps Black ballerinas to be seen and be heard. Um, and um, Black Women's Blueprint, which helps um, advocate for women of color and teaching them how to, how do they, you know, back to Kenzie's question, how to how do they work within the, a world that's of the dominant culture? Um, how can they be more productive in the communities that they're in? And how can they um, ensure they're seen and heard um, in the mainstream um, world that we live in? So yes, they are on the site. <laughs> Fantastic, that is so great. So please everyone be sure to check out Optimus Made and, and get those masks because we all need them today. Yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us for our webinar today and special thanks to Rochelle and, and your story, just really moving, really moving. And thank you so much for advocating for change because I think especially within the business community that's leading the change in, in various places that it's really necessary. So again, thank you. Um, so please join us for our next webinar. Next week we have two coming up on Tuesday with Dr. Parham and on, on Thursday with professors uh, Mitch Hamilton and Jillian St. Clair. So we hope to see you there as we continue our conversation um, around the changing business landscape. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day and holiday weekend. Thank you. Thank you.